somehow remember that everything we post online has to be remediated, so we need to take care of that, but I think we'll make it available for individuals to ask. And before we start, I wanted Rob to go through how this session will work, because this is an open session of Senate, so he's going to summarize for us what the process is, what the governance is that regulates this legal. Okay, so some of you um, are familiar either as, as former guests or uh, in some cases as former members of Senate um, with the fact that we do have guests show up at Senate meetings. Um, what's different about this one is we now have a larger room. Um, so um, believe it or not, this is spacious accommodations compared to our normal meeting place. Um, there are a few items of business that need to be taken care of at the beginning of the meeting, um, and that's going to be the approval of minutes, uh, receiving a consent calendar, and I believe we have a degree to approve. Um, that will be for elected and appointed senators only. Um, I'm guessing it's unlikely that any of you who aren't on Senate right now want to comment on the minutes, but um, you will have those items just for people currently in the room. Um, when we move on to the discussion, we're going to um, we anticipate questions, we're going to try to take questions in um, as open a manner as possible. Um, please be mindful there's a high turnout, um, so we're going to try to give everyone a chance to ask questions. Um, as we move about the room. Good afternoon, senators, and good afternoon, guests. I'd like to, good afternoon, I guess I'll wait for the first time. I'd like to take just a few minutes to highlight the executive committee minute, um, uh, meeting on October 7th. Um, the executive committee met on October 7th, and one of the things, or there are three things that we did that I wanted to highlight. One is that we actually approved the final charge to the Academic Policy Committee, um, and the, the goal of the Academic Policy Committee is actually to take a few minutes to look at, um, consider the feasibility and implications of re revising our Miami graduation credit hour requirement for, from 128 to 120. During that executive committee meeting, we also uh, reviewed a, a, a draft of the charge to the governance committee and the charge of the standing committee, uh, and, and we actually had Jim come to our October, uh, I think it was 20th, or 21st meeting, 19th meeting, and I'll talk a little bit about that in just a few minutes. Uh, one of the other things that we did on that October 7th is we also um, made committee appointments, and we're still working on getting those rosters filled. We also met on the 19th, and some of the things that we talked about during the executive committee meeting, we discussed how the faculty assembly works along with the university senate, uh, and a number of options were proposed during that meeting for increasing awareness to faculty about a clearer understanding of how the faculty assembly and university senate work together. And Our goal is to increase the participation of faculty at future meetings of the Faculty Assembly. Uh, we also reviewed the charge of the Governance Committee with Jim Kipper, and specifically the Executive Committee uh, would like the Governance Committee to work with each committee, standing committee in the Senate, to examine activity, number of meetings, work, pro work product, and historic documentation of the committee, and actually benchmark our committees with other institutions. In terms of new, and actually you can find those minutes, um, Senators, on Attachments D and page 56 and Attachment E, page 57. In terms of new business, uh, there's a proposed Bachelor of Science degree in Applied Science uh, with major in Applied Social Research, and Marianne Petunio is going to talk with us a little bit about um, that degree. So thank you very much for uh, welcoming me back to Senate. I served here uh, for a number of years, and I know you do important work, so I appreciate being able to come to you to ask for your support. Um, so I, this is the degree that we are seeking your support for. It's a Bachelor of Science in Applied Social Science, which is a major in Applied Social Research. So what does an applied social researcher do? Essentially, applied social researchers use quantitative and qualitative data to look at complex social phenomena in both the public and the private sector. So they can work in healthcare, they can work in industry, they can work in business, they can work in government, and they can work in, in education. Graduates are a program you can see, hopefully, I know 
which um, many people in the back might not be seeing, but we have the, um, the student learning outcomes, the learning outcomes for our major up here. We believe these learning outcomes describe transferable skills that graduates of our program will be able to use in a variety, a variety of um, a variety of professions. So why apply social research now? Well, first is I tell you, and you may be aware of this, when we develop a degree, it goes through a long and extensive process. And part of that process is speaking with local um, leaders and community and government and business through our advisory boards and also through the work that the um, development team does. And I can tell you that both the advisory boards, both in Middletown and Hamilton, were really excited about this particular degree. Um, when they looked at the degree and the, the skills that it provided, they felt that this could speak to a regional market as well as a state, state market. Um, a couple of things I want to talk about specifically up here. There's a lot of statistics, um, but if you see at the top, it talks a little bit about growth areas in very large fields, um, whether it's healthcare, for example, community social services, et cetera. I also want to talk or mention more specifically a particular area that is a high growth area, both in Ohio, it's one of the top 10 fastest uh, growing professions here in Ohio, but also nationally, and that's market research or social research, survey research. Um, prior to uh, my life in, in academia, I worked for the Gallup organization for a number of years. They're a very well known uh, market and public opinion research uh, company. This is the kind of degree that somebody who was interested in going to survey research, whether it's market research, opinion research, could, um, could complete and, and be employable. In the Cincinnati, uh, Middletown metro area, there are more than 100 uh, polling companies that are, uh, that are here um, and, and looking for, for graduates. So we think that that's one area that might be, um, might be a market for these, for these graduates. But generally, when talking to employers, but again, locally, they're interested in having graduates who can look at a complex problem, whether it's in the public sector, in the private sector, design research that helps to understand and provide maybe responses to that uh, particular problem, and then implement solutions. So we, again, see this as a, as a degree that's applicable to, to many, many different, um, different areas. Also, um, it's a degree that draws on our existing resources. We have a variety of highly qualified uh, social science uh, researchers at the regional campuses. You may be familiar with our Applied Research Center, which does a lot of very notable work in the state. Um, so this is, again, a degree that we are drawing on existing resources at the, at the regional campuses. So in terms of looking at the actual requirements for the degree, I'll just talk very briefly about the curriculum. There's 27 to 29 hours of core courses in geography, um, in various social sciences, statistics, for example, um, is required. But it's organized around three seminars, right? ASO 201, 301, and 401. This is similar in structure to our Bachelor of Integrated Studies program, which also has three, a, th a series of three seminars. And the idea of this, again, is that to, to give building blocks to these students as they proceed through the program, to get them guidance from when they initially start in this degree um, to when they complete this degree. There's also a required internship or independent study experience. What our research found was that for graduates in this particular kind of field, um, they're much more employable if they've had that internship experience. And we think we can provide those experiences, whether, again, it's through our Applied Research Center or through the other connections we have in the community. And I'll also mention, um, just as a side note, this is a cutting edge degree for this particular area of, um, of the state, Southwest Ohio. If you were looking at similar degrees, you would have to go to University of Wisconsin Stout. Um, Colorado State University has a program like this online, or Hofstra University. So this is not a degree that we feel that local students can get easily. They also have advanced electives, um, 15 hours of advanced electives, again, anthropology, black world studies, CIT, which is a department that we have over the regionals, English, geography, psychology, and sociology. And again, part of one of the goals of 201, 301, and 401 is help students think about how these electives work together uh, in, a, in a coherent unit. I'll also mention, too, that the courses that we would be offering for this degree are courses that we're already offering. Right? So these are our courses that, um, I believe, with the exception of a couple of anthropology courses, these are courses that we're already um, enrolling, enrolling students. So I want to mention, again, the team members, as I said, 
Uh, this is a, a, a broad uh, spectrum of faculty um, at the campus. I am not a subject matter expert in this. I was essentially the facilitator for a very hardworking group of folks. So we had John Cinnamon from anthropology. We have Byron Miller from sociology and gerontology. We have Barb Oswald, who is here uh, with, with me today from psychology. We have Lisa Skierzewska from geography, who I know is a senator here. I believe she's unable to be here today, but she also worked on this degree. We have Bob Seifert from sociology and gerontology, and of course the Applied Research Center. I believe he's here today. I haven't seen him yet, so hopefully he's here. Um, and then we have Sri Subedi from sociology and gerontology. Um, so these are the team members that worked on the degree. Again, it's a it's a, a, a long process. We've been working very hard on this. Um, we're happy to answer questions. I'm joined today uh, by Dean Michael Pratt, as well as Associate Dean uh, Kathy Bishop-Clark. So with that, if there are questions, as I said, I'm happy to answer them or defer to my more knowledgeable subject matter experts. Thank you. Yeah. This is great. I saw it on the University Curriculum Committee. And I, Pardon? Uh, this is great. I saw it on the University Curriculum Committee, and I support it. But we had mentioned also things about WDS and gerontology classes as part of the degree. So I'm just going to comment. I hope that you uh, take into consideration those suggestions that we made about a month ago at that meeting. Right. We did, yes, we did. Thank you. Yes. And one, you don't have a lot of room, but is it all senators? Okay. Well, that it's only senators. That, that Senate, a senator, this is, a, this is Senate business. So for those of you who came in late, we have an extended session here. This is Senate business, so Senate, senators speak, senators vote, senators comment, and then when we have the presentation, it's a, we'll open it we're open session. Okay, so we, we do, I'm sorry, but we have to keep to the business of Senate. I add Latin American studies to my comment. <laughs> <laughs> That's fine. Yeah, we're going to vote on the resolution in just a few minutes. Okay, Senators, as you can see, here's the resolution here. Be it hereby resolved that the University of the Senate adopt the proposed new degree, Bachelor of Science degree in Applied Science, with major in Applied Social Research, College of Professional Studies in Applied Sciences. And furthermore, that the endorsement by the University of the Senate of the proposed degree will be forwarded to the Miami University Board of Trustees for consideration. Do I have a motion, Senators? Move so Second. Second. Vo vo eyes, please. We'll do voice fully. Votes. Aye. 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 Opposed? Abstentions? The ayes have it then. Senators, you've had the opportunity to read the consent calendar. Do I have a motion to approve the consent calendar? So moved. We second. Thank you. Ayes? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Abstentions? Okay, this consent calendar, calendar is actually approved. Uh, Senators, you've had the opportunity to read the University Senate minutes from the October 5th uh, meeting. Uh, it's attachment A2. Can I have a motion to approve the minutes? So moved. Second. Second. Ayes? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Abstentions. The minutes have been approved. There are no items of old business. We do, in fact, have a special report. And I'd like to take just a few mm -hmm. minutes to introduce um, our provost, uh, Phyllis Callahan, provost and executive vice president of academic affairs and David Kramer, Vice President for Finance and Business Services, and they'll talk a little bit about the university budget, the university budget explained. So we need to get Mike. <coughs> and I'll remind everybody, anybody who came in late, this is being videotaped. We will make it available in some way. Um, we just have to be sure that it's accessible before we put it out publicly. And I do have some reminder language for everybody. Yes. Yeah. 
Uh, in an effort to ensure that everyone is given equal opportunity to ask questions while keeping the process moving forward, uh, Rob will keep track of who and what order has requested time to speak. Senators, guests are asked to keep their comments and questions to two minutes, but only speak to an individual issue twice. Okay, so while David's getting my, let me just say a couple of words. We um, are trying to get through some material on the university budget. There's a lot of information here, and we would really like to get through at least this part of it. Okay, we are happy to, to come back and do more. Yeah. So we're asking that you hold questions yes. until the end, yeah. and you're going to make sure that we have questions at the end, even if we have to cut the presentation short. But yeah, this so is organized is. in a way that it's we like hope will be an overview. <laughs> We'll um, address some of the issues around faculty salary and faculty configuration, and we want to be sure that we're able to share that with everyone and everyone has a chance to hear it. Thank you. A lot of this came out over the summer. I was collecting some data on faculty salary. You know, we changed it from credit hour rate um, for this semester. At the same time, one of our members of the executive committee was asking OIR for similar data. So I asked, it was Kathy Wagner, I asked to just wait and let us talk about what data that senators wanted. Executive committee can ask for whatever data they want. They can have whatever presentations they want. There's nothing to hide here. We're happy to share the data. So um, having said that, I have our CFO with us so that we can walk through this in a significant way, and he will provide a good number of the details. So David Kramer. Good afternoon. Can you hear me? Am I on? Can you all I don't. Him? That's the reason why I'm, I'm... Can everybody hear David in the back? No. no. Is he actually... Is it on? No, not, the, mic, the mic is just for the video. Oh, oh okay. You're going to have to yell. Then I'm going to have to speak up, which is not what I usually do. So hopefully you'll be able to hear me in, in the back. I apologize. I, when I stood up, I didn't realize how many people we had in the room. So thank you for being here. So why, where do I need to point? There we go. Uh, what are we going to cover today? We're going to do just a very brief general budget overview to give you a sense of some size and scale of the budget. The major budget of the university is something we refer to as the E&G or education and general budget. Um, one of the significant issues we want to cover here is what has changed and I'll spend a good bit of time talking about how different things are today versus what they looked like prior to, say, the 07, 08, 09 period. Can I just interrupt for a minute? There are seats down here. I don't think these senators are coming. If you have a seat open next to you, would you raise your hand? So people, there are seats you can fill in, especially by the exit door. Yeah, we have some who can't even see, yeah. see so the screen. Down, so. Take a seat. There's a seat here. There's three up here, there's two on the side. Thank you. Uh, we're also going to spend some time uh, very briefly on staffing. The provost will discuss faculty compensation, and we've had a number of questions about employee benefits. We have the issue of reserves that uh, seems to generate a lot of conversation. I'm going to try to, uh, to cover that particular issue and hopefully explain uh, some contradictions in some of the terminology that gets used. And then, uh, as the provost indicated, our goal is to leave time at the end so we can take as many questions today and then also figure out what other things we can do to be more open and sharing about the information uh, on campus. So with that, one of the uh, emphasis points, uh, this particular discussion will focus almost exclusively on the Oxford campus. Uh, we've already spoken to the dean of the regional campuses about how we can reach out to that audience with a presentation that is more specific to their issues. What you have on the screen today, we have what, in general, for operating uh, purposes, are three distinct budgets. Uh, we have what I mentioned, which is the primary budget of the university, what we call the E&G, which is the general 
budget. I do note that this general budget includes something that some of you will be familiar with that we call designated funds. Designated funds are revenues that we dedicate to a particular department. The biggest example of uh, designated funds are course fees. So a department that sets a course fee, while it's a part of the overall ENG budget, it's not centrally managed. It's managed by the department. Any funds that are unspent are retained by the department. Another major component that is primarily the activities of what we have in ENG budget, but it's something we refer to as the restricted budget. Two main areas make up the restricted budget. Sponsored funds, so any grants, contracts, state, federal funds that come in fall into this category. Uh, the sponsors of those grants dictate how those funds are used and any funds that are left over from those, how those are to be employed. This also includes our fundraising, gift, uh, endowment, and other activities related to philanthropy at the university. Those funds, again, are determined by the donors, how they'll be used, unless the gift is unrestricted or is given some breadth to the institution about how those funds will be employed. Term that some of you may be familiar with, but probably most aren't, what do we mean by our auxiliary budget? We have several what we think of as business enterprises on the campus, uh, the largest and most significant being our housing and dining program. Uh, those operations generate their own revenue and they operate within the budget that that revenue allows them to uh, accomplish. And the major issue that I've tried to note down here at the bottom, historically we've always had a lot of restrictions about anything going between these other sources in here. Again, donor controlled. What we are increasingly now experiencing because the legislature for a number of years has restricted what we can do with tuition. We're also finding that we can't do things between these budgets. Funds that come in for these purposes in general need to be used for those purposes. We can't raise room and board to get around the tuition limitation so that we can do something with those room and board revenues. This gives you a sense of where that uh, budget is being spent for the entire institution. Uh, we tried to summarize some of the things to give you a sense of what is more directly connected to the academic or student functions of the institution. You'll see that's by and far the largest portion of our overall spend. You'll see that the next largest area again, as noted earlier, is expenditures directly related to those auxiliary activities. It's broken into the plant institutional support, uh, various ways of describing this uh, that I've heard in recent. These are really activities that support the mission but aren't directly related to the delivery of the mission. So uh, most of my functions fall in here. Uh, finance, accounting, uh, human resources. We also have in this area the provost office which central administrative operations fall into this category. We have things called the general fee. A portion of our tuition is dedicated to certain student activities, and that's what comprises the general fee. Debt service is what it, uh, what it describes. Uh, we have debt. Uh, we issue bonds to do certain projects. This is what is spent annually for debt service. Where does most of this come from? Uh, all but $6 million of this comes from here, the primary source of funding for this is for residents and dining halls. Uh, today, I'm trying to remember the precise amount on our uh, uh, balance sheet this year, but we have about $620 million in debt. All but about $60 million of that relates to these auxiliary activities, primarily the residents and dining halls. I spoke a little bit about the auxiliary operations. What I wanted to give you is some sense. There are a number of activities that are embedded in that auxiliary budget. This is a list of those. It's intended to give you some size and scale of where those uh, monies are generated as well as how they are spent. By and large, you can see the largest operation within that category is our residents and dining hall programs. 
It makes up more than two-thirds of what we uh, uh, generate and spend related to these activities. The uh, next largest is the Schreiber Center, which is primarily the bookstore, our catering, some of our other dining activities in that operation. And then we get a lot of questions about intercollegiate athletics. I noted earlier that I didn't mention that uh, it makes up about 4% of our overall institutional spend. And what we try to do here was break down how that spend gets funded. Intercollegiate athletics generates this portion in the red. Uh, the rest of this is generated from the general fee, and you can see we've heard a good bit of conversation. The largest spend of our general fee is in regard to intercollegiate athletics. But we also broke out for you so you can see functions that normally would be in the E&G budget are also embedded in intercollegiate athletics. Uh, this is for scholarships for those athletes. This is for student support services related to their academic initiatives. The amount that actually goes on this, the sport is this portion right here, the red plus this blue area. About $11 million in general fee goes in support of uh, the sports themselves within intercollegiate athletics. That supports 18 sports, 11 women's and 7 men's. And as a note, which uh, this entire budget is probably about a little less than a fourth of what OSU spends on football alone. Obviously, they sustain those programs on their own. They generate a huge amount of revenue. But understand, this is what we're spending on 18 sports versus four times that on a single sport. Where does the most of our funding go when it comes to the EG part of the budget? Not surprisingly, uh, when you think of our institutions, we are largely people and buildings. So we spend the majority of our funds on salaries and benefits. Uh, it takes about, uh, for every 1% growth in our salaries, it takes about $2.5 million. So what has changed? And a lot has changed. Uh, this is what our budget looks like for the current year, how it's proportionally broken out by the sources of revenue that generate that budget. You can see the vast majority of that comes from tuition. The point that I tend to make over and over again in PEC and other conversations is don't be misled in this is the only thing that's enrollment driven. If you go into this state appropriation budget, over 90% of it is enrollment based. So we're very, very dependent upon enrollment at the institution. Uh, when we look and compare ourselves nationally to public universities, we're going to be in the top five in regard to dependence upon enrollment and tuition. When we look at the, uh, those private institutions of $100 million or more, more than half of them are less dependent upon tuition and enrollment than we are. And that's one of the significant issues that uh, we have been facing and continue to have to deal with. So did that picture look like that always? No. If you go back into the 60s and 70s, uh, the balance between tuition and state support was much more even. Ohio has always been a high tuition state. I've been doing this for a long time. Uh, if you go back into uh, the 60s and 70s, Ohio has always been in one of the top 10 states in regard to tuition. It's just been a value that's carried through the decades. This began to get a lot more significant, though, following the FY91 year. This is a 25-year scan of what's happened with what we call our basic st uh, support for students. Uh, we get Occasionally, some other dollars, we get capital appropriations that are restricted for that purpose. We occasionally get appropriations specific to some activity on the campus, but the portion that is available for that ENG budget is shown here. You can see what's happened since 1991. We did pretty good. These two indexes running up here, here's the consumer price index most of you are probably familiar with. There's also a custom index for higher education. And that's what that index line is reflecting. 
This custom index reflects the fact that we're com our compensation is much more personnel in nature, human resource in nature. So our costs tend to rise at a rate faster than the general market basket. You can see what's happened. We've seen a lot of volatility. Uh, we uh, uh, going clear back to 1991, and these dollars are not uh, adjusted for inflation. These are nominal dollars. So these are actual dollars that came in. We were almost back here in FY12 to the amount we were appropriated in 1991. The gap, as you can see as we're going out here, continues to widen. And what is pretty consistent with the state appropriation is that while it goes up, it almost certainly will come down in the next negative economic cycle. If you look at most of the long-term projections, this volatility is going to continue to be there. We're an aging state. There are economic issues with aging states besides the cost of taking care of those aged persons. Uh, our revenue outlook for the state relative to its spending is not very positive. So this trend is going to continue where we may make improvements. We've been gradually bumping up, but you can see we're just about where we were a decade ago. That while we had the declines in here, we've had a more positive appropriation cycle for FY16, but also a cycle custom by, uh, uh, accompanied by the fact that tuition was frozen. But this has become almost a static source of funding for the institution. That in essence, as you I noted here, over this 25-year period, the average rate of growth from here to here is less than 1% per year. There we go. So how did the university fund its budget if state support has not been a source of funding? Uh, this is what it looked like from going from fall 1996 to fall 2006. Tuition went from $5,058 to $11,994, or an increase of, uh, where I got it there, thank you, 138, uh, almost 138%. Had to find it on the chart. That was an annualized rate of increase of 9% per year. What has happened since? the fall of 2006. We've grown by a total of 18.7%, which works out to less than 2% per year. So our growth in not only state support has been almost static, but now we're seeing very modest change in tuition. Balancing budgets, I was a CFO, I've been a CFO in this state since 1992. This is how budgets were balanced. If we had an enrollment problem, tuition went up. If the state cut our support, tuition went up. That is not the environment we're in today. Affordability, if you read anything that what's going on nationally, affordability is the exclusive and primary issue that the federal government as well as state governments are trying to address. And we continue to receive mandates on how we can accomplish this type of situation going forward. So if our revenue had slowed down uh, from both state support and tuition, because we had no growth in this decade for uh, 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 the state appropriation and very modest growth for tuition, then how was the budget balanced? Come on. What do I need to do? Thank you, sorry. Let me try to explain a chart that's probably got too much information on it. <laughs> so what am I trying to convey here? Let's go back and look at what was going on in this period of time here. Uh, we had very uh, good increasing demand for the university. You're seeing the quality of our academic entrance scores going up. Sizes of classes were reasonably predictable. Overall enrollment up until about 2002 was up. This was prior to, I believe, 12 or 13. Our largest enrollment at, at, uh, for undergraduate enrollment at Miami was back in here. Very predictable. 
uh, kinds of situations in regard to that enrollment. And then obviously, we had the annual increases in tuition. You'll start to see more volatility in this period right here. This was a period in which we moved to the single rate of tuition that used the, the non-resident tuition with combined scholarships to uh, uh, affect enrollments here for Ohio residents. What we began to see in that period of time was more volatility around the enrollment. The overall enrollment during this window of time declined with the most negative impact going back to the fall of 2009. Can you explain the colors of all the bars? So oh, okay. Thank you. So uh, the provost reminded me that uh, uh, the in-state enrollment is in this bluish shade. The tan color is the non-resident enrollment. The green reflects our ACE, our international, a portion of our international enrollments. The black line is our major competitor in Ohio for selective enrollments is Ohio State, and it shows what happened in this window of time for their ACT score, and this line reflects the ACT score for, for Miami University. Here's where the dramatic change began to occur. We had two things occurring with both our enrollment. Tuition now is rising much more slowly. How do we uh, achieve our revenue targets? This is the period of time in which we had the strategic priorities conversation on campus because this is the issue we were trying to address. In a very slow revenue growth period, how do we continue to manage your budget? Largely in this window of time, it's been managed through unexpected, actually, enrollment growth. We had projected some enrollment growth in this period. Because of changes that we made, recognizing we were more enrollment driven, we began to make significant changes in our missions activity, and as you'll see in a minute, in our scholarship approach. The result was more demand than we expected that has helped to produce surplus revenues that weren't uh, anticipated in this window. Without this, we were on a trend that was unsustainable. No growth, very slow growth in tuition, no growth in state support, and declining enrollments, which would have made it difficult for us to sustain service levels that we've historically been able to provide our students. Sorry, thank you. So what was another element of change in this window of time? Not only has the rate of tuition been slowing, but our uh, appropriations uh, for scholarships has dramatically increased. You can see in this window of time, while we had risen to only about $16, $17 million in financial aid available to uh, undergraduates, We've grown that over 400% since 2007. Uh, again, helping to meet the affordability expectations we're facing today, but also helping us to better shape the nature of the classes that we have been enrolling and to help us to encourage the additional demand or enrollment that we've experienced during especially this period of time right here. One of the questions we often get is, well, Instead of funding it this way, uh, could we fund this uh, additional financial aid through endowments? And obviously, that is one of the priorities that we want to achieve. Unfortunately, the magnitude and size of doing that. To replicate what we are doing here in 2016 would require an endowment that would be available for this purpose of almost $1.6 billion. Part of what came out of the strategic priorities recommendations and even before them was there was a faculty committee that looked at the way budgeting occurred at the university and suggested that the old incremental budget approach that's more associated with a much more predictable revenue generation by the institution that we move to something that some of you have probably come to understand is responsibility centered management or the RCM approach. Part of what this is intended to do is give you a sense of how prioritization and 
control over resources has changed since back here. Here's the level of funding. The red reflects the academic colleges and the amount allocated in the budget for their purposes. This reflects everything else, including any surplus revenues during the year that were managed centrally. What has changed here is that both the proportion, because there's been more cost reduction down in this area, but also any surplus revenue. So as we have exceeded our enrollment targets, this year being a good example, the goal that we set for emissions for this class was 3,550. The actual enrollment is 3,806. All of that additional resource has been allocated into the academic colleges and schools. Now, with that hasn't just been additional revenue sources. There are also additional expectations. Uh, they're much more accountable and responsible for the decisions here, including their own enrollment and their targets. The other piece that has come with this is that we have continuing issues with academic facilities in space. Uh, we're being underappropriated enough to keep up with that. Uh, there's more and more responsibility for funding capital projects occurring in this area as well. But this is another significant shift in the way budgeting is done today is that in order to be closer to the decision makers that impact both faculty and students, more and more control of the resources are located here. I think this is an issue that, as we'll talk a little bit later about the reserve question, is that I think there's still some challenge with the deans in trying to absorb all this responsibility, understand what the long-term budget outlook looks like and how to properly manage these additional duties that they have. So what are we paying attention to? One of the problems with becoming more enrollment dependent, more dependent upon enrollment growth, is enrollment growth is not a long-term sustainable approach. This chart tries to show you what we have projected. The board asks us to project out regularly what we believe, based upon current trends, our budget outlook looks like. This is where we are today. Uh, again, a larger class than expected. Our expenditure line is here. I'm sorry, our uh, expenditure line is here. Our revenue line is here. We are currently operating in this year with a surplus that will be allocated into the academic colleges and schools. But part of the problem is that when we look at the trends, we've now looked and said, well, long term, we'll try to set enrollment targets at 3650. 44% non-resident. We know what is going on with uh, his, uh, recent uh, tuition trends. It's frozen for resident tuition for the next year, but then we've assumed a 1.75 uh, rate of increase, which is what's happened in the last decade. We've looked at the recent trend in our state appropriation and built that into the model. We're actually assuming no continuing growth in the uh, scholarships that are provided, all that, that's probably optimistic. We've looked at an ongoing salary increment pool uh, with comparable growth in our benefits, uh, but with some increased spending for credit hour faculty as well as market adjustments for associate and full professors. When we run the model, this is the problem you have when we're enrollment dependent and have become accustomed in the last three or four years to enrollment growth is eventually the expense line begins to cross the revenue line. Uh, this is the very problem I presented to strategic priorities. Our overall rate of increase in revenue from those traditional sources of tuition and state support won't keep up with the expense line that's outlined here. So we face the difficult issue. Do we continue to grow? Do we look for alternatives such as greater endowment and philanthropy support, but we do still have this long-term problem. And this is affecting today's decisions because we're not anxious to make commitments that only a few years out we may not be able to fund. So I've covered a lot. There's still some more to come, but let me just recap some of the issues. We have three major parts of the budget. 
Again, the major issue there is the size, but also the difficulty of uh, moving funds between these three primary areas. When you look at our enrollment dependence on the ENG budget, it's over 93%. This is affecting many of the decisions we make about what types of things we need to be doing, how we fund scholarships and other issues associated with that enrollment dependence. Significant growth in this period of time in the amount of student financial aid that's improving our affordability for students, but also having impacts for our budget. 58% of everything we do inside the university is tied directly to academics and student support. 75% of what we spend in the E&G budget is on staff and faculty. And when you look at what we spend on intercollegiate athletics today in support of 18 sports, 11 women's and 7 men's, 2% of our budget goes in support of those, directly in support of those sports. We're going to move on and uh, we're going to cover uh, some additional issues that there's a lot of interest in. I'm going to do this chart and then I'm going to ask the provost to, to take over. Uh, here's what's happened with staffing. Each fall, and we did this a little bit early, so uh, I always worry when we take these snapshots out of sequence, we might get some uh, uh, issues with the data, but typically each uh, October 31st, we take a snapshot to give us a sense of how staffing looks uh, today. And then this is back before <coughs> many of the staffing changes occurred back in the fall of 2008. And you'll see the trends that have, uh, that have occurred since then. Obviously, uh, with the growth in enrollment, there's been a growth in the number of faculty. Uh, one of the issues the, the provost is going to address is that when we look at the mix, there's a decline in the number of tenured or tenure eligible faculty. Some of this relates to the difficulty of any time we're in an enrollment growth period, something that I've dealt with elsewhere, but I don't believe Miami has ever experienced as much growth as they are this, in this recent period. But there's always a lag in filling these positions versus other more temporary ways of dealing with that enrollment growth. And then we've seen a considerable reduction in non-instructional staff. Okay, thanks. So these are data that are posted on the public website and I shared at the opening of the administrator's breakfast with the chairs and program directors. And so I want to walk through it a little bit because I think it shows some important trends. Um, so these are from 2004 through 2015. The red bars, the red section of the bars are always the tenure, tenure eligible sections. The blue sections of the bar, which are a little bit obscured by the numbers, but you can see the second piece of the bar are lecturers and sample faculty. Again, these are permanent faculty. And the green section of the bar are visitors. So in 2004, before lecturers were um, on campus, you can see the distribution was 675 tenure track, 174 visitors. 2008, 2009, major economic downturn. Right, major economic downturn. So yes, that trend started to decrease. 659 went to 633, went to 599, went to 580. As we start to get a handle on where the economy is and the deans and I start to get a handle on how our budgets fall out and how our class comes in, you start to see that come back up. So from five, from 2013 to 2014, 12 additional tenure track faculty from 14 to 15, 592 to 610. At the same time, the instructional capacity is what I think a lot of the chairs and program directors need to pay attention to and do pay attention to in their conversations with the deans. And so although there has been this decline in tenure track faculty, which we are now reversing and are committed to reversing, you'll note that the permanent faculty numbers have increased in large part due to the hiring of lecturers and clinical faculty, as has the visiting assistant professors and visiting faculty, full-time visiting faculty, because they give flexibility to the chairs as they're trying to adjust to the differences in the, in the demographics of the class. And so when we look at this, 
I'll look at this. Uh, so know. this right now we stand at 16.7 percent of total tenure line faculty or in lecture or clinical faculty lines. We do monitor that very carefully. And um, 75, where are we? This is not coming up. 65% of the total full-time faculty are tenure, tenure line faculty. So our permanent faculty are 75% of the, our instructional full-time faculty. 75% of our full-time faculty are in tenure, tenure track lines or in lecturers, clinical positions. And again, as David pointed out, one of the things, we date the data, I always date the data, this is as of October 21st, so if you compare it to what's on the provost website, it's gonna look a little bit differently because this is a dynamic process, right? So the other piece is, um, salary, is the hiring plan, the hires and the searches. This is to give you an idea of where we're trending. This was in 2012-13, again, the red are tenure, tenure track, the blue are lecturers, clinical faculty. Oxford only, 20 with nine lecturers, up to 32 in 13, 14, 23 lecturers, clinical faculty, up to 42 in 14, 50, up to 58, 15, 16 hires. Searches currently are at 43 for tenure track and seven for lecturers, clinical faculty. And that changes somewhat throughout the year as we go through the search process. But again, <coughs> the trend is up. <coughs> I want to go through the salaries by rank, assistant professors, associate, and full professors. These are all IPEDS data. I wanted to be very careful to match the data from what we report to what's reported nationally. And so what is done here is the red bars are always Miami Oxford salaries. The rank is always here. The next bar, oh, these colors are too close, sorry, but the second bar are national doctoral public universities. Then the blue bars are Ohio Dr. Republics, and the other dark bar at the end, the fourth bar, are the Ohio Board of Republics. And you can see for assistant professors, Miami's average salary is actually above all the other categories, because I think we paid a lot of attention in hiring assistant professors to be as competitive as we could be. And those of you who have been chairs or are chairs or have been associate deans, you know that that's something that we really try to make sure we bring faculty in at very competitive levels. And then this is with benefits, because the other piece of this is to consider what kind of costs there are for benefits. And again, these are IPEDS data, same thing. And when you add our benefits to this, assistant professors are well above the average for all other categories, and have been for a while. These are the associate professor salaries, and I'll remind you now, the associate professors have had the benefit of two years of market adjustment with a third year coming next year. These data only report the impact of one year because the reporting cycle is always a year behind. The other thing I'll remind you is that we have increased the bump from assistant to associate professor to $6,000 and from associate professor to professor to $9,000 to try to deal with any compression or inversion issues. So again, when you look at these salaries, 2005, it's the same scheme, right? And what you can see is that Miami is above the other Ohio institutions. That's 85,643, and the next highest one is 84,949. And when you add benefits, again, associate professors are above. This is, again, the impact of only one year of that market adjust. We'll see the impact of the second year next fall. The professor salary is here, same arrangement. 2005, 2010, 2014, our salaries for professors lag behind. They absolutely do. We have one year of market adjust on here. In that one year, average salaries for professors rose $4,700. So we made an impact, but obviously we have to do more. And then this is with benefits. And when we add benefits, Miami is still above the Ohio publics, but we have to do more, and we're in the midst of doing more. Second year of market adjust has been done, third year is coming. So this section, we want to talk just a bit. We want to remind you we understand the employee share of health care premium has increased. It's increased to 19.7%. That average increase per employee amounts to $80 per month withheld. That's prior to tax calculations, so the actual out-of-pocket is reduced by the employee's tax rate. And this is consistent with a directive from the Board of Trustees to increase premium to statewide averages. And for those of you who were on Senate at the time, you'll recall that the Benefits Committee came to Senate 
several times to talk about the change in the cost of the benefit to align Miami with statewide averages. And this was also endorsed by strategic priorities. We reached the goal for the employee benefit so that we are on par with the statewide average. So there's no increase in employee contribution plans for the new benefit year that starts in January. And there are certain other changes that have been implemented to try to offset the change in the cost of benefit. And that includes reducing, oh, I'm sorry, I keep hitting the wrong button, reducing copay to 90-10 when certain providers are used and those providers are available online through the benefits page. The benefits committee is continuing to explore other cost reduction options for employees. And the other thing that I personally like a lot is the health centers available to employees um, for no cost, for no copay or deductible. So you can go to the health center and get some care without cost. So the recap here is we're steadily increasing the tenure tenure track faculty while keeping the LCTLs at less than 20% as mandated by Senate resolution. The faculty salaries are above average at the assistant professor rank, above average in Ohio at the associate professor rank, below average at professor rank. And I'll remind you again that this is the target of the market adjust, the associate and full professor rank, to make those salaries more competitive. We're increasing faculty salaries across all ranks with the market adjust. Healthcare premium is now consistent with statewide averages. And to offset the previous, the, the increases, these are the kinds of programs that have been implemented. The health center free, to reduce the copay for certain providers, and the benefits committee continuing to explore options. David's going to go through the words. Right. And I believe this is our, our last section, and we'll get to, to your questions, which is where I know you want to get. Uh, one of the things that I um, wanted to just stress here, and we'll mention this, remember, this is like your bank account at home, where your savings account is. And so we want to deal with some definitional issues, but keep in mind that these are not necessarily able to be replicated each year. We do have those balances that are available. So if you went to, we just uh, are finalizing. Uh, the state has just ratified our balance sheet. These are the amounts that show up in something that's called net assets. This is the true term for what has been referenced as reserves. This is an accounting term. It's a balance sheet term for those who know uh, a bit about financial statements. Uh, this is the amount in three specific categories that we're required to report. So we have something that is called unrestricted net assets that really aligns back with that E&G unrestricted budget as well as our auxiliaries. We have restricted net assets that aligns with those endowments, with restricted gifts, with any sponsored funds that we receive. And then there's a component called value of buildings or uh, investment in plant. This is net of the amount that is associated with uh, both the original value of the building, less depreciation, also less debt. You have to remember that up in this category, debt is not offset in here. We may have a balance up here and still have significant debt due uh, by the university. So this is what it is at June 30th, 2015. Part of the reason I stressed the fact that this is an accounting statement we don't control the accounting rules. Uh, we have certain standards that the state requires us to report under. They're national standards. The state then sends auditors in to make sure that we're reporting under those. Uh, here's what happened with those categories back in 07. You'll see, as the provost mentioned, this is that period of time that we faced uh, financial issues. We saw a $76.1 million, almost 40% drop in that, I believe. Um, I arrived here just as this was occurring. Uh, I got here in June of 2008. Uh, there were a number of questions. I remember at a particular faculty forum about the overall drop in our net assets during that period of time. What has happened since? If you looked at without accounting rule changes, this is what it looks like, would have looked like today. Why is this big red bar in there now? Well, we had an accounting change. 
We are now required at the institutional level to reflect that portion related to our employees that resides with the two retirement <coughs> boards, the deficit that they have in funding their pension liability. So we've had about $270 million of what's called a liability come down here. Now, technically, uh, we, if that hadn't occurred, we would have seen those net assets grow to about $485 million. So if you've heard a reference about a half a billion dollars, that reference without this is actually correct. So what makes up this and why uh, is there so much in regard to reserves? Well, here's what <coughs> the board I think of as our reserves. This is the amount that is there for those central emergencies. This is the amount we use for economic stability. Uh, in some sort of a crisis, it provides about two, uh, two months of operating uh, reserve to get through those issues. What happened to this back in that period of time right here? It went red. We had a $77 million. It was only at $37 million at that time. So we had technically a deficit in that area that we have gradually been regrowing because it served its pur purpose during this window, but we can't deal with future issues if we don't rebuild it. What else makes up what we call net assets? Several years ago, the board looked at the balances that were there and decided that that would be better purpose to create a quasi-endowment. So whenever you hear the report of our endowment, I think it's roughly $480 million now, $75 million of that was created by a board action, primarily for the purpose of supporting student scholarships. This does provide us a little additional uh, protection because the reality is the board could redirect that in some sort of a financial crisis but its intent was to say that these funds should be used for future purposes to better serve our students. The one thing that, that I should also mention about this, uh, we're not a corporation. Every dollar that here ends up in some way benefiting the university and our students. There are no distributions that are done for any other purpose. So every dollar eventually is available there to be spent. Where, if this is what we think of as being primarily our central funds, and this is only uh, roughly $140 million, then where's the other $340 million? Well, it's broken up. In essence, one of the things that I maintain is almost like a bank. We have funds that are out there in other units that we monitor, we track, but those funds largely are under the control and use of other parts of the institution. Where are the primary areas where those funds are located? Well, as a result of our new budget approach, if there are any surpluses at the end of the year, they're being swept up into the academic colleges and schools. As that's occurring, uh, they're looking out long term as to what types of needs they'll have. I've noted in here, if you looked at our recent six-year capital plan, it calls for the spending of $40 million in local funds in order to execute that plan. That's one of the areas. We also have ongoing classroom improvements. We've started now for, I believe this is the third year, uh, setting aside $5 million each year that the, that the uh, deans must match to, have, uh, to allow us to do classroom improvement projects. Hopefully most of you have some experience with some of those improvements. In addition to what is in the colleges and the, and the schools at the dean level, there's $17 million out there in academic departments. A lot of this is related back to course fees, faculty startup funds, other things that have been set aside there. The provost also retains an amount that's used that her discretion and uh, in conjunction with the deans to look at academic initiatives, initiatives, equipment needs, other things to invest in our academic programs. A portion of those funds reside with the regional campuses almost 35 million. What happened? Went too far. Sorry. 
we don't allow other academic departments to uh, retain any salary vacancy that they have, but any other funds that they don't spend, uh, they're allowed to retain that. We have associated with balances in academic or non-academic departments about $34 million. The board authorizes capital projects. Capital projects take anywhere from 12 to uh, 24 months to accomplish. Projects then have funds sitting there that while they've been committed have not yet been spent. There's about $53 million in that category. There's also uh, for possible facility emergency and other needs about $10 million sitting there that I manage for any particular uh, unknown uh, facility uh, need that might arise. The other besides the largest growth has occurred back in our academic departments, but the second largest growth has occurred here with our auxiliary operations. And let me spend just a few minutes before I wrap things up here, but uh, this has grown quite a bit. Uh, uh, when I arrived in 2008, uh, we had a set of residents and dining halls that the average age since the, any improvement had been made in those was 61 years. We had a number of issues with code problems that in today's world uh, you couldn't construct buildings of that nature and we were rapidly heading towards a point where we were concerned that we could no longer sustain those facilities and it takes years to make this size of an investment. We estimated 15 to 20 years to execute the plan. Normally what happens, those buildings initially were built by the state in the 1950s, anything that was built since then was built based upon student fees. Typically when the debt on those student fees is retired, you begin to reinvest in those buildings. That didn't occur. The estimate when I got here with a plan which called for $900 million in spending with $7 million in the bank. That was unsustainable. We had to revisit that plan and we've substantially revisited. That's why you're seeing buildings being renovated instead of new buildings being constructed. We had to construct some new buildings because we need swing space. Otherwise, we would have had to reduce enrollments because we didn't have any place to put the students while we were building, while we were remodeling the existing facilities. There also were some buildings we're just not going to be able to retain. It's too costly to improve them. We have taken on since then $475 million of debt to help us accomplish that. It won't accomplish the entire project. We have gradually, because we've used the debt to this point in time to make those improvements, we have tried to accumulate monies because the next phase of this is $340 million and I have $109 million today. So I have to still figure out how we're going to close this particular gap. There are other major needs. Uh, uh, we made a commitment to get away from coal. You don't do that without an investment. One of the other things that's funds are intended. We've got a $40 million investment we still need to make to move away from coal and to move into more efficient, environmentally sound types of approaches to heating and cooling our buildings. So when you get done, if you don't back out that pension liability, here are the funds that we're tracking for the institution and how they're being identified for the purposes that they will be used for. So to recap, one thing I hope it would stress is that while we have this category, it allows us to look at the, our financial performance. It's really not reserves. Many of these funds are controlled by other units other than mine, and the reality is we have tried to always make sure we have identified purposes. The other thing I'll stress, we operate much like we did back in 08 and 09 in a much more volatile period. We're much more susceptible to enrollment declines today than we've ever been. We are susceptible to further reductions in state support. We still have the need to continue to address the affordability issue. Reserves are one-time monies. It's really a bank account. Uh, that chart I did to show what the future trend looks like. You can't uh, sustain spending off of your bank account for an indefinite period. Much of the allocation 
about more than about 30% of those funds reside with the academic uh, uh, divisions of the university. One of the things that throughout here that I think is prevalent, because of the 08, 09, 10 period, everybody's become much more conservative in their spending. More funds have been accumulated. I think the RCM budget approach, the deans are still trying to grasp how much and how quickly can we commit funds. We've been in this enrollment growth period that has produced positive surpluses, but there are also needs to have faculty in positions in response to the additional enrollment growth. Finally, I'm sorry. <laughs> I do want to point out that at your tables you have these terms and there'll be other glossary of terms. We wanted to be sure these are government accounting standards board's terms. Mm -hmm. Go ahead, sorry, go ahead. Yes, I was hoping that we could go back to the slide that shows the different types of accounting standards that are included part-time faculty. Sure. It doesn't include part-time, it's all full-time. Those data are all full-time and there's a reason for that and that is and, I, and I'll get those data to you as soon as I'm in, when I have them live. No, they're all full-time but visitors. So everybody on that graph is full-time faculty. The green bar, no, green bar. Oh, okay, so that, that slide I need to take out because that iPad data, well, there's a reason. The iPad data, people report in different ways. I have to determine if those are body counts or SCEs. So before we make comparisons across universities and across institutions, I need to be sure that those are those comparisons are similar. The one I walked you through, the red, blue, and green, those are all, by definition, full-time faculty. So universities report data in different ways, and I want to be sure the data that we report are accurate. Do you have some ballpark figures without comparing to other institutions? For example, what percentage of faculty here not only contingent is full-time, but contingent part-time, which would mean adjunct so we, I, I can't answer that directly. I can tell you this, that in most divisions, a lot of our part-time faculty, I think, are teaching one or two courses. In general, when, when a part-timer gets to three courses or 12 credit hours, so it could be four courses, which is the same load as our regional campuses carry, then they are put usually on a full timeline. If they're not, they... What is the percentage? I don't, I, I'm saying I did a yeah. salary that goes to so you want to know what's paid out in vacancy? I want to know what for part-timers. I'm saying I can't answer that. I have to get that data for you. I'm happy to get it. I don't have it right now. And, and anything that we don't have today, yeah, we will we'll we'll provide. We'll share it in any form you would like, as well as we're willing to come back and talk in more depth on a particular issue. Yeah, and the part-time issue is one. there's a lot of parts to the budget and a lot of components and we tried to give you as good We started out with 60 books. some slides that still yeah. didn't cover everything yeah, we, and we could have spent yeah. we didn't want to spend all the time talking at you Okay so we will do a part time I will get that analysis for you I want to be sure that those analyses are accurate before we put them out and I will be happy to do that in the sake of, think, for the sake of time, let's see who is next behind think, Fadia. Okay. Uh, that right? Yes, I'm concerned that um, Phyllis, when you showed the slide about the um, cost controls on benefits, uh, sorry, on uh, hope, on uh, premiums for insurance, mm -hmm. uh, that didn't look too bad. But if you factor in the increase in copayments and other kinds of out of pocket. Uh, uh, increases. I think we all feel that we end up bearing much more of the burden of our health care than we did 10 years ago. And, and that's absolutely true. Uh, and and, and I've been hearing from people who, for one reason or another, are coming up against the fact that there isn't really an out of pocket maximum. Mm -hmm. Even when you use in network providers, you still end up with some costs that you can never. Uh, you can never spend to a point where you're no longer liable. I know of a family that has apparently racked up thousands of dollars, $40,000 in medical expenses this year that were not covered. And I don't know the details about how much of that was in-network or not, 
But when you consider that the hospital that is five minutes from my house is more expensive for me to use than the hospital that is 30 minutes away, I think we have some really serious concerns. So are you about talking about the tiering of the <laughs> providers and yes. that McCullough Height is tier two and not in the 90 cents? Exactly. No. And so we all have, for many of us, have run up against the problem of going to a health care provider who's in network, but the test that they order turn out not to be, or they cancel the procedure because the hospital is not in network, or vice versa. So I think that we really need some more attention to the loopholes and the ways that we can fall into very bad financial trouble because of cost shifting on insurance. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you for your question. All right. Um, thank you very much uh, for the hard work you put into this presentation. Uh, I'm uh, concerned about the ratio of tenure line faculty to the non tenure line faculty. And uh, if I may digress, uh, a mathematician told me that there's something called imaginary number, it doesn't show up. And for us, the imaginary number is the quality of instruction. So how does the increase in non-tenure line and non-permanent faculty uh, benefit students' overall quality of instruction? So Fazia, I would say this, that when visiting faculty are hired, they are vetted through their department in most cases. Chairs are making recommendations. These are full-time, almost all terminal degree faculty. And in fact, some of them are so good that many of you had, have argued that they should be permanent faculty. We have recently started to try to get around our own five-year rule at the request of chairs by making appointments 75%, 25% so we can retain people. I think one of the issues that we probably do need to discuss as a community is what our faculty configuration needs to look like in light of the fact that we need to have flexibility, we, will, we need to have visitors because of the way a class comes in and where they settle. I think chairs and deans always need to have that flexibility. My argument would be I think the quality of our faculty is, is very high, including among our visiting faculty, who by and large, I think, do a very good job. They're evaluated annually by the chairs. They are. You know, we started giving them the, in most divisions, I think this is true, they get the increment pool that's available to the rest of the faculty. It's on vacancy dollars, they're not permanent positions. So I, I, I think we would have to be careful about jumping to the conclusion that because somebody is not on a permanent line, that they're not delivering quality instruction to a class. I think I would, I would really want to examine that carefully, and I think that's the job of the chairs and the directors in the programs as they evaluate their own curricula. Well, if I completely agree with the need for flexibility, I think the question is that if you are uh, uh, on, not on the tenure track, then you spend a great deal of time as you should looking for other jobs. And that does take away. So the question, my question is, I didn't say that we shouldn't have the flexibility. The question is the ratio right, of I agree. tenure track I completely and agree. And I, think what you, and I think what you saw was that we are trying to go back to a time when we had a larger proportion in the tenure track, but I don't think we can deny the reality of the ex economy that occurred in this country just six years ago, six, seven years ago, right? So I think I can tell you as the former dean of the College of Arts and Science and many of you chairs who were sitting out in the audience, it was a frightening time. And so to commit resources to permanent lines at a time when, you know, we weren't really sure what was going to happen. And we also missed our class in 2009. Nine, following 2009. So we had several issues conflate at once that I think made people take pause. And I think now, as David pointed out, as, as there's more confidence in the economy, as we have more confidence in our ability to attract and retain students, you're starting to see that trend go the other way. We got here incrementally. We got there incrementally, right? We're going to have to get back incrementally. And as we do that, the ratio of the visiting faculty will shrink. But there will always be some. I mean, there's, that's sure. just the reality. Yeah. Thank you. I'm so sorry. I don't think, so, right? Sorry. Yeah. I don't know if you can. Can I uh, just ask a uh, follow-up 
Chairman, I, I have a, a question for Dr. Freeman. On the, on the issue of whether of the impact of the listing of out-of-pocket maximum on, on benefits, this is something that was brought up by many people in our preparation for this meeting and the impact of it. And I, I, I assume that this is unintended. And so I would request that the Faculty Welfare and Benefits Committee, I'm sorry, you would request that, that the Faculty Welfare and Benefits Committees of Senate be asked by the Executive Committee to simply examine this and bring a report to the Senate. That's fine. May, okay, so I want to recommend, I want to state this, that you bring these kind of actions, let your executive committee know. That's all you have to do. Anyone who wants Senate to look at something, you have representatives who are senators, ask your senators to please do that. And if you want to come to executive committee, you can directly bring, send it to executive committee or bring it to your senator. We wanted to avoid having this, at this talk, so we have time for people to ask questions. Can but, I ask Dr. Sure. Kramer a question? I, I, I always appreciate your, your very detailed analyses and, and I look forward to seeing the slides up close because I can't always see them. So in your, in your um, one of your trend lines mm -hmm. suggested that FY20 expenditures were outstrip revenue according to some, some assumptions. Analysis. That's right. Well, if, if this is the case and, and your recommendations are, are important to the Board of Trustees, why in the June meeting of the Board of Trustees were un unrestricted quasi-endowment funds redirected for the funding of phase two of the Armstrong Student Center to cover the $20 million that was not reached by the develop by development? And why is Shriver now going to receive an additional auditorium? In addition, why is the athletic department salaries on average as presented in the June meeting of the Board of Trustees, on average for the last 10 years, over 5% per year, uh, as compared with 1.7% for staff. Sure. And 2 point something percent for faculty. If, if, if we have one-time monies and we're looking at 2020, then why the choice is made to redirect $20 million to phase two? Why isn't this put on hold? Now, the the phase two project is being funded in two components, and this was a part of the original plan. Uh, there was a commitment to redirect dollars from the rec center fee to the Armstrong Student Center. That was a major part of that because the debt on the rec center was expiring in 1994, and that fee wasn't eliminated, but a part of the agreement that was reached with the student government is, is it would be redirected to allow for financing to occur for a major portion of that second phase. The other part of that, there's six million dollars that was targeted for fundraising as a part of that project. Of that six million dollars, I believe there was one million dollars that was unrestricted gifts that the uh, Vice President for Advancement and the President determined that the most appropriate use of that was for the second phase of the student center. I know that there are differences of opinions on whether that was a priority or not. Uh, I will say that our enrollment uh, strategies have benefited by that facility. Uh, it's one of those things that was a high priority for students. It continues to be a priority for students. The types of things, the career office that will be going in there are things that today are difficult for students to access but very critical to their outcomes following their time at Miami. But that is a priority that the board has agreed in and the president and the vice president for advancement had determined the most appropriate use of those funds. We continue to advocate for gifts going into scholarships. I think that long term is the most important thing that we can do. In regard to Shriver, there are multiple things going on in that building. The $20 million project is dealing with infrastructure and other issues. There's also on the third floor the Renella and Disabled Services offices will be relocated there because they don't have adequate space today. The lower level that is today a vacant dining facility will be uh, remodeled to serve as a welcome center primarily for prospective students. Like it or not, uh, I'm trying to stress earlier on 
93% uh, of that budget is dependent upon our enrollment and our success in doing that. We have made additional expenditures, increased budgets in areas in emissions, and made that a priority because we believe long term that will help us to sustain enrollments. If we sustain enrollments, we will be able to do other, other things with the institution that are also critical. The salary issue, I think, is a very legitimate point. Uh, I know uh, the thinking that went into those decisions between the board and the president. When we began that period, our uh, athletic uh, coaches in football and men's and women's basketball were at the bottom of the conference. During that period of time, much like we're doing with faculty salaries, when we identify a non-competitive situation, resources tend to get directed there. We are attempting to manage uh, uh, the athletic budget much like any other budget. And I tried to point out, as a percentage of what we spend at the institution, it's very small. Uh, if you looked across the nation, University of Alabama, Birmingham just attempted to eliminate intercollegiate athletics, or, or I should say football. Uh, that decision, I think, lasted two or three weeks because it's still a major part of our institutions. It's a part of the experience that students have here. We certainly have not done well. Uh, but it remains a commitment on the part of the board, of others, that this, for the institution to be able to offer an entire experience for students, it needs an intercollegiate athletic program. We need to be responsible in the way we allocate resources for it, but we do, and we need to set expectations for them. But it is an important part of the student experience. Madeline and then the young woman in pink. Madeline. Oh, thank you so much for um, all your hard work. I know it's not easy. Uh, I have um, one suggestion. Um, actually, uh, there have been nine questions that my colleagues have in the UP have listed. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but, uh, okay. Um, I sent them to Stacy uh, already. Do you want them entered into Senate minutes? Yeah, 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 just for the sake of time. Because sure. I, I think rather than speaking them out, sure. um, I sent them to Stacy, I think, just as a um, collegial thing that's important. I have two um, specific questions. The first one is um, I, I don't want to open up a can of worms, but I, I am somewhat concerned about the alternative retirement plan. Yeah, and that's a legitimate concern. Okay, so, um, but I'm also, just from a, a moral and ethical standpoint, I do think that we need to attend to how we, teach, how we treat our um, part-time faculty, and I understand why they can't, you know, we, we have to be flexible and they can't be in all the graphs and everything, but we are one of the best undergraduate teaching institutions in the nation. Um, I think we can do better um, by a part-time faculty. I think as a moral and a pedagogical and a ethical imperative of the university that we should really be attending to that. Um, so I look forward to the further um, information that you give to us on that issue. Sure. That uh, was just your comment question? The would, question was, yeah, the question was, the comment was about adjunct faculty the motion or whatever the recommendation was to read the nine questions into the minutes. Got it. And then my question is, what the age is going on with alternatives? Yeah. Um, <laughs> can, can we address alter? Can we can we do with that at another session? I, is yes. that Okay. Because I don't. I think it is a different topic, and we we're happy to do another. Okay. And we'll provide information. We need to do that university wide. Yeah. But you have to remember, we're not controlling the oh, decisions yeah. about that. So. So I recommend that to the. But we do need to get information out about it. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. So, my question is how I also follow up to Madeline's question. Since uh, lecturers and clinical faculty are what you just said and emphasize as a part of uh, full time faculty, but all the discussion about compare, comparing salaries between institutions apply to tenure right. faculty. Is there any interest in harmonizing? I'm in the midst of trying to do that. So, again, so. So one of the things that really I want to be careful about is Can when we you look at the these questions, data, please? I'm sorry, thank you. 
So the question was about all the data applied, the salary data are for assistant associate and full professors. What about the salary for lecturers, clinical faculty? So, and I said, and I started to answer. I'm in the process of doing that. I want to be sure that the comparisons are the same because clinical faculty at different institutions mean different things. And so I, I need to understand what's in each database and get a reliable database or at least understand what the comparisons are. Before I can tell you that on average, at Miami, our lecturers, clinical faculty are now in about the fifty-two to fifty-five thousand dollar range for salary. That varies across division, but that's an average across the institution. So, but I, I will definitely organize these other data, and I'm again happy to share them. Steve. Yeah, I wanted to thank you for the presentation. I thought it was a great amount of work there. One thing though, I didn't see a detailed slide about that. I'd very much like to see a detailed slide about is the gross numbers and salaries for administration, both administrative and budget. I'd also like to know what is being done. If you work on your projections, 20 years, 15, 20 years out, uh, for faculty need and, and students you may or may not have, what you're projecting by way of need for uh, future administrative support, both in terms of numbers and in terms of cost. Okay, so does everybody hear that? Um, and let me make sure, I want to repeat it. So it's uh, interest in understanding the projections related to growth in the number and the salaries for administrative costs. I'd also like to see the history of uh, the and growth, growth of the number of positions. I mean, we have a lot of vice presidents now that we didn't used to have. And uh, I'd also like to see their uh, growth in their salaries as compared to uh, faculty and staff. That would be a nice slide. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Nothing to hide here. Other questions? I, I'd just like to pursue. I'm sorry. No, you were, no, you were fine. You were fine. I just like to pursue a little further the issue of the university's thinking about spending money on health care. Could you speak up just a little bit? I'm sorry. I'd like to get some more information about the university's thinking on expenditures on the health plan. There was a slide which talked about uh, wanting or projecting that expenditures on benefits would grow much faster than salary expenditures, I believe. That was the assumption built that into was, there. That was uh, tying to what was perhaps an overly optimistic uh, view that there'd be 3% a year increase in salary. Well, uh, medical you know, health care cost inflation, under the most optimistic estimates, certainly will be more than 3% a year. So what you're saying there basically portends some kind of continued cost shifting cuts, something has to happen, right? And, and I, I think part of what gets lost in here is that the Benefits Committee, uh, that the Benefits Committee of Senate spends a good bit of time looking at these issues. Let, let me just observe a few things. And so we build an assumption. Uh, we try to be somewhat optimistic because we have maintained that the last few years through some cost shifting. That The cost shifting is not a long-term strategy that the Benefits Committee is looking at. There will be some natural cost shifting because if the share for faculty and staff is 20%. If the overall cost of our benefits rise, there, that share will rise, not in percentage, but in dollars contributed. So what are the strategies long term? And there's one other limitation we have today I don't think is well understood. We are precluded by 2018 when the health care law requires a penalty tax for what they call Cadillac plans, which I would guess nobody in the room would agree what they have determined to be a Cadillac plan. But that's the requirement. The law says we cannot pay that tax. That is one of the restrictions we are under as we go into that process. So we have to figure out how to manage this within both the health care law as well as what the state is saying we can and can't do. Are the strategies playing out in the Benefits Committee is probably to do what I heard was not acceptable. Looking at high performance providers and creating incentives for the use of high performance providers. One of the very strange things about healthcare is that the best care occurs at the institutions, those providers that are also the most efficient. And so I would expect one of the things that the committee is looking at today is creating incentives to using those more efficient providers. While I understand the convenience from McCullough Hyde, and I've had several conversations with Tri Health about some of our uh, benefit policies that have come out of the Benefits Committee, 
The reality is many of those services are three times the cost of what we can get in the Cincinnati area for something similar. There, there is restriction. If you're going to be 20% of this cost, the reality is if we're doing things that drive that up further, your share is going to rise as well. And we will be forced into more situations where dollars can't go into salaries because they're going into our benefits plan. Can we make that work? Your, your concerns are very legitimate. This is a really challenging issue for the country as well as for organizations. But uh, the Benefits Committee has really spent a lot of time trying to map out strategies that will allow us to preserve, in some ways, if you choose the right providers, to improve, reduce the out-of-pocket cost that goes with it. But this is an ongoing issue that we're going to have to wrestle with. And I wish I had better answers today. I think there was a I believe it's our contribution to benefits. It's the university's contribution to benefits is higher, is greater. So I, I believe that's what it is. Valerie, let me, I'll check on that exactly because I don't, I'd have to look at the and, and part of that depends on what the cost of the health care spend is. That's the greatest yeah. variable in there is what is, because we're, we're fully self-insured. So the cost that goes through that benefit rate is what we're actually incurring. Could you please share, are there any guidelines that department chair of degrees have in hiring part-time faculty and whether or not the standard in the past has been to have at least a master's degree? Because that, I think, has shifted. Well, it's always, you're supposed to have the degree above the level at which you're teaching or some kind of comparable experience. In fact, we just had a discussion. Are there any deans here? We just had a discussion at COED, and we're, we're putting together mm -hmm. guidelines now for chairs. Because to date, it's always been the chair makes a recommendation to the dean, the dean reviews it, and we've always thought that that's best happening at the local level, but because there, there is disparity across the divisions, we're trying to set guidelines. It's always been the case, you're supposed to have the degree above the degree that you're teaching in. But we do have clinically licensed faculty with a tremendous amount of experience, including professional experience. I'm looking at Steve Molinak, because you take a field like architecture, the clinical pra the practice of that field is extraordinarily valuable. So somebody with a degree in back a bachelor's degree, we might have approval for. So, but we are providing guidelines. We are writing up guidelines. I think Cheryl. Yes, um, I want to. Um, to reiterate my colleague's appreciation for all the hard work and the detail he put into this, it is greatly appreciated. Since the, since the request to include uh, the questions that were submitted in the minutes, I would like to make a motion at this point that the Executive Committee of the Senate charge the appropriate committees to investigate the issues raised in those questions and report their conclusions to the Senate and to the Board of Trustees. We're outside of new business. I'm sorry? We're, we're in the presentation. We're outside of new business. Just do, can we do it at the next Senate meeting? Yes. Just do it at the next Senate meeting. Make the same motion at the I'm next sorry, Senate meeting. I'm sorry. I couldn't hear you. Okay. So the, uh, Charles Ganellan was, was uh, making a motion to charge the Executive Committee with investigating these issues and report back to Senate. We're outside of Senate. New business. New business. So technically you can't do that. Just bring it to the next Senate meeting and make the same motion and we'll vote on it with the Senators and then we can do it from there. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Sorry. Okay, I have a, a general question and then a couple of quite specific questions. And thank you so much for doing this. I hope that we can do this every year. Much appreciated. I wanted to ask about the message that. <laughs> I'm not kidding. <laughs> um, I, I know you work with Fiscal Priorities Committee, and I'm curious about what um, what method Fiscal Priorities Committee has established for finding out about faculty and student priorities on financial issues at the university. Mm -hmm. The, they attempt to do that through. Sorry, David. Sorry. Sure. 
So the question was, what, if, what does fiscal priorities committee do to ensure that they're hearing the concerns of faculty and students as they work with administration? Is that correct? That's right. Yeah. Thanks. Okay. And part of what they do is that they schedule uh, persons to come in and speak. Now, the makeup of the committee is partially to do that. There are two student members, a graduate and an undergraduate student there, to help ensure that those issues are there. Obviously, the dominance of faculty in the makeup of the committee is another part to ensure that faculty voices are there. But then they determine uh, who they will ask to come in and present on a particular issue. So each year, you know, athletics is an issue that they have uh, uh, presentations from the athletic director on so that they can probe more deeply in regard to that particular budget. Regional campuses have been an issue that they have tried to follow and, and uh, Dean Pratt has presented each year uh, in regard to his information. The deans typically report. There will be student uh, presentations on particular topics that are of interest. Would you say that the Input of Fiscal Priorities Committee has a significant impact on final budget recommendations? We, we consult with them throughout the year. Uh, the, one of the things that you have to understand about the new budget model, most of the determinations are actually made out in those academic units. The only thing that is recommended today, if there is a change in what is allocated for the administrative purposes, and so that will go through the Fiscal Priorities Committee as well as we have uh, what we call an RCM committee that's made up of representatives from each of the academic colleges and schools to make sure that there's consideration of what it is that's being proposed as a change. Um, thank you. I have, I have a couple questions about... Um, oh, you're at the limit. We said just two. Oh. Oh, sorry. I think you're worse. In the I, back. Think Layton, Layton, I think Layton is next. Is that the person you didn't hear? Is that yeah. What, that's I, what? I, I, it's a big difference. Were all the slides nominal or real dollars? I just wanted to they were nominal. All of them? All of them. Okay, thank you. Okay. We did put the, as you saw, there were, to give some context in what trends were, there were some uh, comparisons to other changes, but they're all in nominal dollars. Um, I know that there's been a, a national trend in terms of scholarships, so there's been a shift from major scholarships to merit as a way of, in a sense, producing more revenue by discounting tuition for out-of-state students. And so I'm wondering, in that statistic, the 400% increase, if you also have statistics on how much it shifts us to the poor, there has been a way to do that. Uh, merit -based and merit-based aid has gone up here. The, the, uh, this last year, we made a specific new commitment to need-based aid. But uh, we can get the data and... You want the like, relationship between... The question yeah. was about the, the scholarship dollars for merit scholarships versus need-based scholarships. Right. And you want some comparison to a relative amount or relative ratio yeah, or something? Yeah, the, the relative ratio, whether you know, move based has gone down, because I, I mean, because I know that scholarships are now being used to generate revenue by, by bringing in more out of state, which is at a lot of institutions, and I'd like some data on how sure. this is happening here. Yes. Yes, you. Well, well, the category that you emphasize the most is instruction and other activities. Now, I, I, I'd like to know what, a, what other activities are. I understand what like instruction is. Yeah, and, and if you would like, the question was in regard to how do we provide uh, additional information about where the budget is spent. If, if you go to the budget's office website, there is a set of detailed uh, charts and data there, exactly what every unit is allocated. But so, might I just offer that, I, you know, you think about support units, right? So the Howard Writing Center, the Honors Program, uh, e-learning. You think about those areas that are not providing classroom directly, but they're providing a kind of academic support and infrastructure for academic quality, right, that, that the university has to support. And those are not in-classroom dollars, but they're dollars that provide support to the academic mission. And related to that is when we count full-time faculty and tenure-track faculty, are we, are we counting people who are doing administrative work? For example, are you counted as a 
Yeah. No, in fact, thank you. Celia's sitting right next to me. She, <laughs> next to you, she provided the data. Yeah, we tried to be as clean as possible with comparisons because, you know, if you're not, you, you have to have clean data. So we try to, and it's actually pretty difficult to do when you look at national data sources because universities don't all report the same. So I tried to be as clear and consistent as possible. If they were in administrative roles, they were not counted in the faculty rank. Any other questions? One more question. Yeah. Yes. I'm new to this Student. body. So, mm -hmm. ask, um, do you ever break it down by college or even division by the face to face faculty to student ratio? Because I'm assuming some divisions are operating in the red and some are in the, in the black. Do you, is that true? Are there some in the red and some in the black? And if so, do you put emphasis? I mean, seeing that expenses are going up, do you pressure those divisions that aren't operating effectively? more so to Can I make this that question? balance. Go ahead. I, so, I would you're... really like to answer this question. So the question was about are, are there units in, that don't make money? Yes. <coughs> there are units that don't make money. And as a university, we accept that there are and will be units that don't make money. And there's a process embedded in the RCF model. It's called subvention. And what it does is it's set at the beginning of the implementation and here you can correct me if I say anything wrong. But what it does is at the beginning of the implementation, it set everybody at zero. So that if you were a division that was not making money, we said, You're, we're going to submit you. We're going to take money from the revenue. We're going to take revenue from the academic units that are making additional revenue. And we're going to make everybody even. And then from there, we all start at the same level playing ground. So that, Yes, there are individual, if you, if you, you can, it doesn't work at an individual department program level. It can't. So that's one of the reasons why these kinds of discussions are so important. We have an academic mission, primarily. We are an academic research university. And so we want to make sure that that quality is maintained and we use our revenues, hopefully, in the most effective and productive ways we possibly can. So. That's my little spiel. I always want to remind everybody about that. We want to focus on our academic quality. And I think we're making decisions and trying to make choices to ensure financial security, but also our primary goal, which is always academic quality. So now add whatever I can have left out. You did great. Okay. <laughs> uh, the only other part there, we do have uh, uh, student-faculty ratios by different parts of the institution. And we can get whatever you want. I mean, honestly, these data, we can put together data in the executive committee is a good avenue to direct this question. Just a, a kind of related. Um, so the um, salaries um, for assistant associate and the role that we're comparing to other Ohio institutions and national averages, um, is it possible to get that put down by college? Yes. There's a little bit of a stick and shock for someone in CAS. Whoa, yeah. nobody I know is making. Right. So, so I'll tell you this, you know, I, can get, I, I absolutely have it for Miami. I'm not yeah. sure I can get the comparison. For the national. So but we can get it by divisions, we can get it by cognitive area, we can get it by department. Our own data, our internal data, we can get if, when we try to make comparisons. So in some departments, what faculty have done is um, some areas have very good national data for their fields. So I know in psychology, for example, APA puts out annual reports on their own sort of state of the profession and then by clinical psychology behavior but they give that kind of data if we have that data out in departments or your professional society provides it that would be really helpful to share we'll take one more question sorry, sorry you have one more question i have a question about the the really big red mm -hmm. portion of the, of the i'm not surprised <laughs> so that those reserves were for this year. I mean, that's what we have in the bank right now, right? Like $475 million or whatever. The pension liability, the reduction for pension liability, is that for this year? We're going to shove out $275 million this year? Over how long yeah. period are we talking about? Uh, those are set over a 30-year window. Okay. So, so the, 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 the amount that's not there today is reflected in that entire liability. But it, the current portion of it is not right. going to come so due today. So the that's the reason why. That, that's the reason why it's much taller. Right. Because so we really believe we can, could spend the full 485 million that it and is we available. Also would be that the, that the, um, we would remain flat in the amount of uh, that we wouldn't have any more money going into reserves over that period. 
time. I'm just confused about, you know, if it's 30 years versus what we have in the bank right now. That number will continue to change. The question for the video. So your question is about that 275 million, 285 million dollar red part of the bar. That's the pension liability. Over what period of time is that? Is that going to be? Why are we going to be liable? That uh, the liability over what because period of time? Because from this slide, it looked as if it were we were liable for it now. Okay. And technically, the liability exists today. The payout of that could only occur over a very long period of time because the shortfall would occur as people are retiring. The, the hope is that that will never be an, an expectation of the institution, but we are required to show it even though that it's unlikely that we're going to have to make that payment in that form. However, if the state could shift and say that responsibility is ours, and then we would have to annually make up an amount that would allow that to be eliminated over time. I have a, um, off the, well, it's late. Okay, so. I have two questions, don't I? Okay. Yeah, okay. So, um, what's the about the $400 percent rise, and what is that? Yes. That figure really surprised me, and I'm curious where it comes from, because when I look at the financial statements, mm -hmm. there's, a, there's a, a line for financial aid and scholarships, and for 2009, it's at about 17 million, for 2012, 22 yeah. million, for this year, about eight, 17 million. So what, how come that You have is, to, yeah, they're, they're, and again, we get caught into accounting rules. If you go up to the tuition number, you're going to see a number in there that says uh, reduction for age. Certain types of student aid get directly offset against tuition. You have to add those two numbers together. So if you go to the so you're budget about and the discounted tuition. That's so, right. Which is not a number. So if but the that is, hadn't received the discount, then they would be paying that larger number, but it's not actually money that we're paying out of our expenses. We're, we're reducing the amount of expenses. tuition that we receive from okay. that student. Yeah. We so get less tuition, tuition in, but, in. That as an but the same thing's true of a scholarship. Okay. Okay. What we're doing is taking less money because that scholarship gets directly offset against the bill that that student has. It's just that but accounting it's, rules. It's also a discount, isn't it, to attract the student to come here? And it's one of it's a part of the packages. They decide on coming. how much aid they're receiving on in comparison to other institutions, okay. whether we are more attractive than. Right. There are other options. So just to be clear, we spent four million dollars less on scholarships and financial aid technically this year than we did last year, according to the financial statements. That would be I, I can't believe that's true. So I'll have to. Last year, fourteen. I just looked at the financial statements. If you could email me the question, I'll actually pull the pages out and okay. and send it to you because our aid's been on this. Growth uh, and it depends a lot on the size of the incoming class. Thank you. Well, I'd like to thank everybody for coming. I'm sure that the provost and thank you very much. And any questions? Actually, if there are things that you want to hear from us, from from David, from David Saylor, our intercollegiate athletic director, from Michael Cabaz, our enrollment VP, you can you have a process through your senators to bring it to executive committee, please do so. Well, I think this is great that we share this information and hear the questions, and we are more than happy to do it. We do need time to prepare information, but we're happy to share it. Thank, Thank you all. You. Senators, we need a formal, all of us. formal motion. Senators, wait. Senators, wait. Senators, wait. We're dealing with Senate business. We're done, so we have to make a motion. Can she, can we, whoa, 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 can we entertain, excuse me, ma'am, 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 excuse me, excuse me, ma'am, we can't entertain any new business now. All right, senators, I need a motion for adjournment. So moved. Okay, can I have a second? All right, can I hear a vote? Okay, goodbye, senators, thank you, guests. Thank you. Thanks again. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you.